Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing today? Good. Good. Lumber to the Lord, best decision I ever made, I tell you what. Oh. It was uh, interesting to uh, look at the advertisement for this week's speakers, and I see uh, what uh, Kirk and Cameron's mom speaking in Santa Fe Springs, and, and uh, uh, Candace Cameron's mom, and then I see Todd Moulter speaking in Murrieta. I was like, wah, wah, wah. Are you kidding me? Santa Fe. Paul, is that how you treat Murrieta? Where are you at there? You know, I mean, huh? Santa Fe, Spring, Santa Fe Springs right here? Yeah. Welcome, Santa Fe Springs. I want to let you know right now, it's happening in Murrieta, everybody, huh? <laughs> let them know it's happening here in Murrieta, huh? Yeah, right. Anyway, oh, it's good to be here uh, in Murrieta. I'd much rather be here than Santa Fe Springs, anyways. Um, you know, I feel, I feel compelled simply to do two things in my life, really, and that's to preach the Bible um, and to shepherd people. And that, that, that covers in a lot of, gra- lot of ground. And, um, and uh, yeah, God called me out of uh, uh, the business world, and I, I felt for the first time in my life like the audible voice of God said, are you really going to put your life where your mouth is, you know, and do this? And I, I said, uh, um, no, 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 no. I said, yeah, yeah. And uh, so 2005, right into ministry and, and seminary and a past couple different pastorates. So um, it's, there's, no, there's no better thing um, than to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, I believe, I believe that God, I wouldn't be here. I got a lot of other things I could be doing this morning. But I believe that God's got a word for you this morning without a shadow of a doubt. So I just want to pray really quick. Lord, Lord, I'm here. I'm here simply because I believe you've got a word for these dear people. I don't know any of these people. I don't need to know them. I'm not going to change their life. You know them, and you have and will change their life, God. So God, I pray that you would speak. I pray that they would have ears to hear and that they would have courage to act upon what you are impressing upon them this morning, God. Thank you for this business and for this forum, God. And we promise... We'll give you, and it's going to be hard at times, to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor for the things that you are doing and will be doing in our life. In the name of your son, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Higher calling, a higher call. I just believe that those of us who are Christians don't even understand the call and how high it is upon our life. And and I understand maybe in a room like this that there are most of you are Christians. Maybe there's some of you that are pre-Christian. I always like to think, talk in a positive way because I believe in a God that loves the whole world. And so uh, Christian, pre-Christian, but I believe it's to be spirit-filled and to be, on, uh, to be on mission. To be on mission. What's mission? Well, Jesus walked around and he told guys, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. Now, to be a fisherman doesn't sound like much of a mission. But then he showed them what being a fisher of men looked like. And he went and he, and he taught and he healed and he, and he clothed and he fed and he explained the bad news and he proclaimed the good news. Some of us get that the opposite way. We want to proclaim the bad news and explain the good news. Doesn't work that way. Explain the bad news and proclaim the good news. And that's what he, that's what he did. And then he died for them. That's the mission. That's the call. That's the high call that God has placed on your life and on my life when you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm not sure that we want to at times understand that that's the case, but it is. So I'd love to just for a second look with you. Not a second. Pastors say that. Just for a second. It's never a second, is it? I know. Just for a few minutes. I'd like to look at the beginning where the mission began and understand. And I want to encourage those of you who are Christians, okay, in this room. I want to encourage you in the mission that you're on. For those of you that are pre-Christians, I want you to get a a better, maybe more clear picture of what it really means to be a Christian on a mission. Because I think in this world, and and you in the business world, you're out there, you're dealing with people, they find out you're a Christian, they have an immediate response or reaction. Not always positive, is it? You know? For those of you who are not yet there, I want to give you a clearer picture of what it means to be on mission in this this world. And so, if you have your Bibles, print or pixel, uh, turn to Acts. Acts chapter 2. I know there's a lot of pixels in this crowd, I know. And this is a printing company, isn't it, for goodness sake, huh? Okay, but that's okay. Acts 2 is where I'm going to be. And just to give you a context, okay, Jesus has come. 
Jesus lived his life. Jesus died. Jesus came back from life. Jesus went up to the Father and he said, you know what? I'm going to leave, but you're going to do greater things. And there's this little group, 120 people. Three times this crowd, they're in a room and they're praying. And it starts to get crazy in the room. And Dr. Luke, I mean, you know, you know it's crazy when a doctor starts writing crazy things. <laughs> Dr. Luke, who probably wanted to write a very orderly book about what was happening, writes about all kinds of craziness going on. People speaking in other languages and wind and noise and flames. There's a lot of stuff going on. Okay? Pentecost, huh? You know? Oh, by the way, that's the same Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Huh? Just thought I might remind you of that. Sometimes we've muted the Holy Spirit down to something very tameable. Man, I tell you. Preach, Pastor Todd. Preach, huh? Right? And the people that see this happening, they ask three questions. And we're going to look at those three questions. I believe it guides us to something really profound. The first question, they look at this craziness going on in this room. Doesn't look like all you polite folks. I'll tell you right now. It looks a lot different. First question they ask is, aren't those who are speaking Galileans? Aren't they just Galileans? Aren't they just local guys? You know, how are they doing all of this, okay? And let's look at Acts 2 at the response. At the response, Acts 2, I'm going to start in 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say, okay? These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He raises his voice, it says. In other words, I want you to, you need to hear this. Listen to me. Listen to me. Maybe it wasn't like me where my voice is always a bit raised, but he raised his voice. So listen, he said, fellow Jews, remember it was, a, it was an all-Jewish church to begin with. Everybody's Jewish. It changed pretty quickly. It was all, all Jewish. He says, let me explain to you what you see happening right here. By the way, we're not drunk. It's, it's, it's only 9 in the morning. We don't get drunk till 10 o'clock, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. We don't even eat till 10 o'clock, he was saying. They don't drink until after they eat. He says, we're not drunk. And by the way, just a little warning to you. If you decide to act as if the Holy Spirit really is inside of you, people are going to think you're cuckoo at times. So if everybody thinks you're just fine, then there's a problem, I would say. Okay? But there are going to be times where they're going to look at you and go, cuckoo. I mean, they're just not going to get it. And they don't get it in this scene right here. They don't understand what's going on with these Galileans, these local boys that are acting like they're not local boys. So this is what Joel spoke about. 800 years ago, he says, Joel spoke about this. This is going to happen. And he's talking to a group of people. They knew their Bible. You know, there wasn't a biblical illiteracy problem like there is today. Sorry. Back then, they knew it. They knew it, and they knew exactly what Joel, he's just going to go over what Joel said and remind them of what they already know. And I think that's the call for, for most in pastoral ministry is simply to remind people of what they already know. I'm not going to tell you anything today where you're going to go, God, I never heard that before. I'm going to encourage you in the things you already know because the things you already know you need to act upon. And so this is what, so hey, isn't this, isn't this, isn't this uh, a group of Galileans? And he says, no, 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 this is what Joel talked about and then in 17a he says in the last days here's what joel said in the last days god said i will pour out my spirit on the people stop stop he says uh the last days by the way we're in the period of the last days he reminds them the time between when jesus came the first time and when he will come the second time does that describe our days today it does we're in the last days now i don't understand time so last days could mean a lot of things but i'm just saying he says, you know what, in the last days, Joel said, God will pour out his spirit upon his people. Now, pour, pour, not, not sprinkle, not just flick, not just, hey, why don't you put your toe in? I will, I will pour out, I will, uh, I borrowed a car a few months ago because I was looking for a car for my daughter. Long story, you don't need to know it. Oh, it's a good story, but I'm not going to tell you right now. But anyways, I'm driving a car, I'm on the freeway, and it started to rain and the wipers were horrible, and it was pouring, I had to pull over on the freeway. That kind of pour, a life-altering pouring down of God's Spirit upon His people. Huh? Where you, you can't deny it. It's undeniable. He doesn't say, I'm going to trickle it down, I'm going to just douse them a little bit. He says, I'm going to pour it out on my people. I'm going to pour out what? I'm going to pour out my Spirit, I'm going to pour out myself. Talk about downsizing, huh? 
God gave up heaven to come down and be inside of you. Now, if that ain't the downsize of all downsizes, I don't know what is. But he says, in the last days, you're going to see it. I'm going to pour out my spirit upon my, upon my people. And see, the Old Testament understanding was the only people that got poured out on were the priests and the leaders. And the New Testament, man, even you, even you, even me, it's going to get poured out upon. The fact that Peter standing there preaching says it. Peter couldn't put two words together before the Spirit came. Right? Every time he opened his mouth, he put his foot in it, right? Come on now. In fact, the last, one of the last interactions he had with Jesus, uh, Jesus said to Peter, man, you know, you're the rock I'm going to build. And then he talks about the fact that, Peter, you're going to probably die and it ain't going to be so good. And Peter says, what about John? <laughs> what about John? This guy, this guy has got the Spirit of God poured out in him. And he, he begins to, man, he begins to, to bring it. Okay, the question, like lose track of what the question was. Aren't these just Galileans? Aren't these just local guys? Answer, yeah, y yeah, they are. But when you follow Jesus, you get God. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to follow Jesus, but I just got to tell you, when you follow Jesus, you get God. You get all that comes with God. And I think sometimes we don't think much about that because we want to follow Jesus, and that feels different than getting God. And so I'm here just to encourage and remind you, when you choose to follow Jesus, you get poured out upon you the self-existent, self-sufficient, self-sustaining God. That means he is the author and the perfecter and the, in, the interpreter of all life. I'm just here to remind you that when you follow Jesus, you get God and poured out on you, you get the integrated, the perfect, the immutable God which means he gets his nose and everything and he fulfills his promises. You get poured out upon you, the infinite, bodiless, omnipresent, omniscient, eternal God. He is above space and time. You get poured out upon you. Preach, Todd, the purposeful, all-powerful, sovereign God. That means he's got a plan for every one of your lives and he will see it through. I'm here to remind you that when you follow Jesus, you get poured out upon you. And here it comes. The whole holy, loving, awesome, truthful, faithful, graceful, merciful, long-suffering, patient, constant, good, wise, and generous God. Amen? Amen? That's the God that you get. And I know, I know that you feel scared at times, and I do too, but that God lives inside of you. I know at times you'll feel weak, and I do too, but that God lives inside of you. I know at times you question yourself, and I do too, but that God lives inside of you. And I know at times you do things that you wish you wouldn't do. I do too, all the time, by the way, but that God lives inside of you. And I know there are times where you doubt, and I do too. Too, but that God lives inside of you. And I know there are things in your life that happen that you don't like. The same things happen to me, but that God lives inside of you. And I know that there is hardship and difficulty and maybe even success that wants to pull you away from God. But that God lives inside of you. When you follow Jesus, you get God. And for this mission that he sent us out on, we are more than equipped, my brothers and sisters, to tackle the job that he's given us. And by the way, what's the one thing that fishermen have to do, be the best at? It's a P word. P pa patience. Patience. And I have to remind myself this. All of this within patience. You know, as we work with people, as we love people... <laughs> You know, sometimes my own church pastors settle down. We're coming. We're coming. Not fast enough, but we're coming. Who here te can testify to the fact that God has been patient with them? Amen? Amen. Oh, man. Question two. How is it that each of us hears on our own native language? Okay, Galileans, local people, but how is it that we can all hear there in the language that we, that we know? 17b and 18. 
Your sons and daughters will prophesy. This is Joel's prophecy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour, there it is again, pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Oh. Think about the barriers being broken down there. He says, sons and daughters and servants. Huh? Prophesy. Let's just give a simple definition of prophesy, okay? To speak God's truth into our culture. Okay? To speak God's truth into whatever culture he has plopped you and I down into. And he says that sons, daughters, and servants. Look at the way he breaks the gender barrier down. Huh? Sons and daughters will prophesy. Look at the way he breaks down the social economic barriers. Servants and those they serve will prophesy. Barriers are falling down. And then he says young men and, and old men. And, and look at the way he breaks down age barriers from age 13 to 113 and beyond. Young and old will have visions and dreams. I, love, I think he references men and, and then gives a visual there because we're just so visual, you know. They'll, get, they'll have dreams. They will, they will hear from God, they will see from God, and they will understand. They will understand what God is saying. You know, this is what's going to happen. The young and the old will all, I mean, the barriers, the barriers are just breaking down. I was thinking this week. I'm not sure that in my church, maybe, I'm not sure we understand grace. And I understand it's a big thing, okay? But you know why I'm not sure we understand it? And I know we don't fully understand. The reason I don't think we understand it is because we still continue to talk about them. 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 And, and grace says that we all need it. Grace says that all of us are in the same boat. We've all sinned and are worthy of death. And God has came, and he has saved us all. And when we talk about them, and I hear it in my own church, I, have, I get together and I hear about, in my area, I hear about those Chaldean people in my area. And I understand in that we don't understand grace. And I, I hear in my setting about those homosexual people, that are, I'm sorry, that are living, and, I, and, and they, they don't understand grace. And I hear about those people on the street, like my friend Joe that I met yesterday. Huh? In my neighborhood, on my street. You know, who fought in two wars for this country. And because he struggles with alcohol addiction, um, can't find his way. And he told me, Pastor, I need to get my life back. He gets it. He needs to get his life back. He understands he has a need for the Lord. Now, is that a them or is that an us? Yeah, who needs their life back? Who needs to understand that they need a connection with the Lord that changes everything? Man, I went by where his chair was this morning. I wanted to bring him with you and introduce you to him. You know, there is no them. There is no them. It's us. That's what grace says. You know, and the barriers, I mean, are getting broken down in this prophecy of Joel. Young and old, men and women, servants. I mean, to say that a woman would prophesy is like, we don't get it in our culture today. It's like saying your dog will prophesy. In that context, that's what it was saying. Your, your house pet will now somehow prophesy of the Lord. That was the context that women were in in that day. Don't tell me that Jesus didn't raise the level. Don't tell me that the Bible doesn't raise the status of women and of children and of the downtrodden. Hmm. Okay, question. What was the question? Then how is it that each of us hears in our native language? Well, <laughs> because all followers of Jesus are potential prophets. Huh? All followers of Jesus indwelled with his Holy Spirit are potential prophets. I mean, I, I, you can't help but see, and I know when we think that, we think tongues, and we don't all have that gift, and, and we think predictions being made about the future, and, and miracles. I don't know, when was the last time you did a miracle? I'm not, you know, I know. But think about this. What about giving testimony of what God has done in your life? Is that not prophesying? How about just godly wisdom? Is that not prophesying? How about leadership? How about, I, could, I could make a great case for the fact that Paul is a modern-day prophet because he leads a ministry and a company. And God has given him a leadership ability. You know, how, how about this for profit? How about, how about we redefine it? How about we redefine it this way? To courageously 
represent God in a hostile environment. How about that? How about, is that not like the call on every one of our lives? To courageously represent God in a hostile environment? Is not the world we live in a hostile environment and getting more hostile every day? It is. And God will gift and reveal himself so that we can do that. He will. Okay. So about, about five months ago, I'm in the office on a Friday, okay? And the office, our office closed on a Friday, you know? Uh, I know you think like the trash men, the pastors only work on Sunday, but it's different than that, okay? <laughs> I don't know. I'm in the office on a Friday, and the phone rings, and I answer the phone because I'm the only one in there, and a guy on the other line, he says, I'd like to speak to somebody that's not a pastor. I'm like, dude, you call, you call the church. No, I don't want to speak to the pastor. Pastors have done me wrong in my life. You know, pastors have made appointments with me and they've canceled them. And, and, and I, don't want, I don't have any time for a pastor. I'm trying to think, okay, what volunteer can I hook him up with real quick? I'm trying to, who can I call? And, and, and I tell you what, for a guy that didn't want to talk to a pastor, he talked my ear off for 20 minutes about things going on in his life. I just listened. I just listened. You know, and then as I was listening, and um, he said, you know what, pastor? He said, would you meet with me? I said, of course I'd meet with you. He said, will you meet with me right now? I said, of course I'll meet with you right now. He says, okay, I'm over at the Starbucks next to Barnes & Noble over at Grossmont Center. And I said, come on over. I'm there right now. I said, okay. I'll come over. I said, well, how will I know you? He says, no, you bring your Bible. I'll know you. I said, I'm looking for the biggest coffee table Bible I can find. You know, I'm going to walk up there with that thing, you know. And so I go over there. And I go over there, and I'm walking up. And, and sure enough, right out in front of the Starbucks over here, I hear this there's this guy. He's got this big backpack on the table. And, uh, and so I go and I sit down and start talking to him. And funny things I notice about him, you know, like, like uh, he had a hat on. He had a, he had a white shirt that was like pressed. It had like the creases in it, you know, just things like that, you know. Um, um, his backpack was clean. It wasn't like I didn't think he was off the street, you know. And I noticed funny, I noticed his hands were like soft. Like soft and supple hands, you know? So, no, he had soft hands. I don't know. This guy's weird, I know. But no, he had soft hands. And we sat down and talked. And normally when I meet with people, I listen a lot because people are talking and I'm just listening. He was asking me all kinds of questions and I was talking. He was asking me about what, what my weaknesses are and when was the last time I had a bad thought and I said on my way over here I had a bad thought, you know? And, and uh, no, he was asking me questions and, and I was trying to give him honest answers. Like, when was the last time you looked at something on the computer you shouldn't have? I mean, stuff like that. And I'm trying to tell him what's a computer. No, I didn't say that. No, 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 no. No, and, and, and so I was asking him, and he was, he, he was saying, you know what, I don't have any time for pastors because a pastor stole my wife, and a, and a pastor stole all my stuff. I don't have any time for pastors. And, um, and I had told him, you know, stuff is not my thing. He said, I might steal your wife. No, I didn't say that. No, it's just not my, stuff's not my thing. And so my, my phone was sitting on the table. He grabs my phone. He says, Pastor, can I have your phone? And I hesitated, and he goes, Pastor, I see you're hesitating. And I said, I'm only hesitating because I communicate with my wife and my kids, and they're all out there driving. And, but you know what? You know what? And all I could find out about him was his name was Chris. He was retired Air Force. And so I said, you know what, Chris? Here's my phone. I don't need my phone. He said, I don't want your phone, Pastor. And he slid it back on the table to me. My keys were sitting on the table. <laughs> He grabbed my keys. Unfortunately, I just drive a science. That's no big deal. But I mean, you know, no, he says, Pastor, can I have your car? And I say, see, you know what, Chris? There is nothing more important to me in the world than that you would know Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's my key. I'll walk you out to the car right now. I don't want your car, Pastor. I don't want your car. By that time, I need a drink, I'll tell you right now. So, you know, <laughs> and we're at Starbucks. I'm going to go and get something to drink. You want something? No, I'm good. I left my Bible there. I'd offered him my Bible. He turned me down. So I left it there. I went inside, came back out. He was gone. Just my Bible sitting there. Went to go pick my Bible up, and there he was. Do you think I left, Pastor? Well, I kind of thought, slash hope, maybe you did, you know? 
<laughs> no, no. He said, Pastor, hey, I appreciate every minute you've given me. He said, just a couple more minutes. Would you walk through the mall with me? I said, sure I would, sure. So we walk, we're walking through the mall. And as we're walking through the mall, a guy walks right up to me, gets right at my face, and he goes, are you a Christian? He says, like, is this Halloween or something? What's going on here? You know, he says, are you a Christian? I said, I am a Christian. He says, do you know that we've been chosen since the beginning of time? I said, I do. And he, and he walked away. Just walked away. And we're standing right next to an ATM machine. And he says, Pastor, would you go get $60 out of the ATM machine, a $20 bill for every day that Jesus Christ was in the tomb? I said, I would. I went and got $60 out. And he said, Pastor, would you take the $60 and would you put it in a book of Job for me with your business card? I said, I will. He said, now I'll take your Bible, Pastor. <laughs> I gave him my Bible. We walked to the curb, and I, he said, I, I appreciate it. I said, he said, you'll never regret spending these few minutes with me. And I started to walk away, and I looked back, he was gone. I started to think. He said his name was Chris, and he was retired Air Force. He said his bride had been stolen from him by pastors. And that these pastors had taken all of his resources as well, or tried to. And I said, Lord, what do, you, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to know? You see, I'm nobody. And God saw fit to send one of his messengers to have a 20-minute appointment with me because here's the deal. God will gift and reveal himself to anybody that he cares to. That's right. And that includes all of us in this room. Because we are all, as followers of Jesus Christ, who have God, we are potential prophets in the context in which he has called us to be. And I continue to pray on how to, how to understand and to be able to deliver that message. And believe me, there's been a little bit of Job in my life right now. I could tell you about it. And the opportunity to speak with pastors about that message. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we, we follow Jesus, we get God. Um. All of us are potential prophets. The third question was, what does this mean? <laughs> yeah, that's a big one, huh? What does this mean? What does all this mean? He says this in verse 19. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood and before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And, and everyone, say that with me, everyone... Everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It says there will be wonders and there will be signs, extraordinary events, good, good events and bad events. We see that in our world today, don't we? Extraordinary events which are ushering in the end of the end. The, the, the last days and we're in the end of the last days, if you haven't noticed. Blood. Smoke and fire, not earth, wind, and fire. Blood, smoke, and fire, okay? I mean, this is Revelation, folks. I mean, blood in Revelation 6, 12, smoke in Revelation 9, 2, fire in Revelation 8, 5. And the sun will get dark and the moon will turn to blood. The universe will begin to scream out, what have you done to us? The universe is groaning right now. <laughs> I mean, in so many ways. And there will be that day where it will scream out, what are you doing? And, it, and he says, it's Joel's prophecy says, it's before the great and glorious day of the Lord. If, if it's a judgment day, why is it a great and glorious day? Well, it's the difference between like being prepared for a test and not being prepared for a test. Huh? When you're prepared for the test on test day, it's no big deal. You know, it's good. I was talking to my, my son as we were driving home yesterday, and he struggles in school, and he has three sisters who don't, and so that's even tougher for him. He's like, Dad, I got a B-minus on a history test. And I'm like, great. Did you study? Because I know that you've been getting A's on all your quizzes in history. And he goes, no, but I got a B-minus, Dad. I said, son, that's great, but just imagine what it would be like if you'd studied for it. 
It's a great and glorious day for those that know Jesus Christ who get God. Huh? And everyone who calls, everyone, what is calling on the name? There's no, I don't, I've been looking for 47 years. There's no prayer in here. How about this for calling on the name of the Lord? Help! Help! I know, I broke it and I need you. Help me today, help me. That's good. That's good. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you know what? This is the time and period that we live in, a period of grace. And I don't know if you want to hear this. I don't. But grace has a shelf life. It does. One day grace will be done. This is the time. This is the time of grace. Is there an urgency that begins to well up in your soul? Because this is your time. This is my time where we live in this grace-filled period. You get one life and one body to live it in. To be fishers of man. What are you doing with it? What am I doing with it? What does this mean was the question, right? What does this mean? Well, I'll tell you. I get a privilege to tell you what this means. I'll tell you what this means. I'll tell you what this means till the day I die. It means that Jesus is on his way. Huh? He has mounted the white horse, and he's about ready to stick the spurs in. Huh? He's on his way. He, he's, he's coming. When we were in Hawaii, there was this church, and I love it. I took a picture of it. It was like, Jesus coming soon. That's what it was, the top of the church. I'm like, like a movie moniker, kind of like, Jesus come. I'm like, yes. That's right. But it says that he's holding back because there's still people that haven't heard the good news. Huh? If I had a life first, it would be Acts 20, 24. I don't. But however, I consider my life worth nothing. My only aim is to finish the race. Huh? Finish the race. And to point people to testify towards the good news, the gospel of God's grace. That's it. That was Paul who said that. Sometimes we think Paul was like some kind of a emotionless man. You know, he had people he loved. Or he, he had a family. He didn't just distort it and drop them into the synagogue. <laughs> he loved people deeply. He says, all of that is worthless. Except that I would get to testify to the good news of God's grace. Which God granted him his favor and allowed him to do that till he died. What does it mean? It means Jesus is on his way. How should we live? 1 Thessalonians 5, I'll read it for you. Don't quench the spirit. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. But test them all. They will know them by their fruit, huh? Test them all. And then what you do? Hold on. Here's two very polarizing things. Hold on to what's good. Hold on to it, to the right stuff. Hold on to it and reject what's evil. There's no in-between. There's no middle road. There's no lane down the middle. It's hold on to the things of God and reject everything else. That's a whole message in and of itself, huh? And may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls himself faithful. And I love the last one, two, three, five words. And he will do it. He will do it. I get the chance to to speak it at conferences and, and some retreats and things. And I was, I was up at a men's retreat as I close here just a few weeks ago, Pine Valley. I don't know if anybody's ever been up there. Beautiful place. And I was sitting outside after I'd spoke, just had a coffee. Uh, I told them, just pay me in caffeine. So you know what? That's what they did, you know? And, uh, you know, people were coming by that I knew and I had a chance to speak to them and some people I didn't know that I met. And a guy came up to me. His name was Pastor Jerry. Pastors of church in the Imperial Valley, a little Hispanic church. And he, he started talking to me, and he says, I, I want to share this story with you, Pastor. And he said, I felt that the Lord was telling me that my family and I needed to go to this restaurant, that there was a guy there I needed to meet. So I said, okay. 
So I took my family, and we went to this restaurant, and as we're sitting there looking at the menu, um, um, by the way, God had told him that this guy you're going to meet is going to pay for your meal. So he says, as I was looking at the menu, I was praying that he was paying for our meal because this is an expensive place. <laughs> and so they're looking, and, and this guy comes in, and, and Pastor Jerry and his family prayed before they ate. And this man came up to them, and he said, hey, I saw you guys praying. Are you Christians? And he said, yeah, we are. He said, well, you know what? God had told me that I needed to come to this restaurant to meet somebody, that somebody here had a word for me. Well, sit down. And Pastor Jerry said, I, I believe that God wanted me to tell you that, that he's got a change of plans in your life and that the direction your life was going and that the business you've been involved in, it may be time to consider getting out of that because God's got a ministry for you that he wants you to pursue. And as this man heard this, uh, tears began to well up in his eyes and began to run down his cheeks. And he said, <laughs> he said, Jerry, he said, Jerry, I'm a, I'm a truck driver. I'm a truck driver, and I dropped off a load here three days ago, and God told me to stay put. Because I got a message for you in this restaurant on this night. And he said, I came in and I, I hear this and my the emotions are welling up because, you see, my wife and I have decided that it's time to get out of the truck driving business. Last week I put my notice in and we're getting ready to go on the road to serve God all over the United States. And this is a tough decision and we just needed some assurance from God and encouragement from God. And God has brought it. Man, he hugs all around the table. Thank you. And this tr previous truck driver gets up and he starts to walk away. And he goes, oh, by the way, God told me to pay for your meal too. Pastor Jerry. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Jerry told me this story. And he said, you know what, Pastor Todd? He said, I believe that God had spoke to me and asked me to sit down here with you and to ask you a simple question. Do you know anything about Bethel Seminary? That was a seminary I went to. He said, you see, I'm just uh, needing to get back into seminary, and I'm looking for any kind of in that I can get. And I said, Jerry, <laughs> I know Bethel Seminary. I went to Bethel Seminary. And I pulled my phone out, and I said, and by the way, Here's an email from a man that I know there asking me just two days ago if there's anybody that I know of that's in ministry that could use a seminary education. See, I didn't do any of that. God did it all. I, I promise you, if you commit to be on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ for the entirety of whatever time he gives you on this earth, you will not regret it because, you see, he will do it. He will do it in you and through you. Let me pray. God, thank you for this message through your word, God, and through experience and for this dear group of people, God. And I just sense right now that there are some weary folks in the room that just needed to be encouraged that you will do in them greater things than they could ever hope for or imagine or believe or even deserve. God, I pray that you would root that message down deep in their heart, God, and that they would take it wherever their sphere of influence is, in their business, in their families, in their, in their church, in their, in their neighborhood, wherever it is, God. That they would live empowered by your spirit that has been poured out upon them. And you know what, Lord? If there's anybody with an earshot of my voice right now, which is probably blocks, by the way, but if there's anybody that does not yet have a relationship with you, God, I pray and right now that they would, in their heart, they would cry out to you. Help. It doesn't have to be just help. I'm a sinner. And I need to be saved. Thank you for loving me, forgive me, live with me. I'm tired of doing it my own way. I pray that there would be hearts in this room right now that would cry out. Here in Santa Fe Springs. 
You're a good God. You are a good God. Your mercies are new every day. And even, even in the most difficult of circumstances, you are a good God. Even when things are going well, you're a good God. When I think less of myself than I should, you're a good God. When I think more of myself than I should, you're a good God. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and I love you for that. And because you love us, we can love other people, God. So God, do what you need to do. We are yours. I love you, we love you. And we lift our voice to worship you all, our Lord, rejoice. Take joy, my king. Hmm? Thank you for today. And, and I ask all of these things in the great and the glorious and the mighty name of your son, Jesus, that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess his Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 God bless you. Well, you know, uh, you really blessed us this morning. Thank you so much, Todd. Yeah. Yeah. What a powerful word. And uh, I just want to piggyback on that real quick. What the Lord's been dealing with me about is if our heart is truly to use our gifts and our talents, our resources to reach people with the gospel, sometimes that's frustrating, as you said. You know, sometimes it's discouraging. Sometimes it's just like, why is this not happening the way the Lord has given me the vision, right? Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of patience. But yeah. We can be encouraged to know that if our heart is truly to reach people with the gospel, that God loves those people more than we do. Yeah. And he wants us to do it even more than we do. So in his perfect timing that he will bring that to pass. He'll do the work. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That's right. So we're going to open it up for a quick Q&A. Take about uh, five, ten minutes. If you have a question, make sure you raise your hand. Please wait for Roger to come over with the mic. We want to make sure we have everybody hear your question. Did you ever get your sword back from the man at the mall? <laughs> no, I didn't. This is exactly the same looking one, but it's a different one. So, no. Nope, he's got it. I'm planning on getting it back in heaven, my brother. I tell you what, you know, hand it right back to me with my business card in it. <laughs> and your $60, right? Yo. <laughs> yeah. Which, hey, good right. thing you didn't say 100 for each day. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Hmm. Do you think you could give us a little animation and excitement? Yeah. It, it really <laughs> ram it home. Just kidding. I'll, I'll work on that. I know. I know. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's just, yeah. 
I'm not sorry. No, never mind. I'm not sorry. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about your church. Yeah. Um, Legacy Church is five years old. I came two years ago to Legacy, built a relationship with the pastor there who planted the church, who was a professor of mine in seminary. We just started to talk a little bit about that. Um, so it's a church of about 400 folks and growing. We meet in a middle school, have offices next door, and are just committed to our neighborhood in La Mesa and uh, out from there. You know, but it's, it's a good place uh, to be. Um, I was previously at Whittier Area Community Church in Whittier, which is a larger church in Whittier that uh, we had been at for 27 years. So that was, you know, even though it's just a couple hours away, it's a big call for us to consider that. It's the only home our family's ever known. And, and, uh, but uh, you know what? Anywhere, anyhow, with anybody, at any time, that's the call, right? 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 So, yeah, so we've been, been there two years. Yeah, it's been good. Thank you for your transparency. That was amazing. Um, so has Chris revealed himself in any way, or has God revealed Chris back to you in any way? Yeah, you know, it's been just kind of unfolding. I really kept it to myself for a, a while, not knowing what God, I felt responsibility, you know, for how to, and so I've had the opportunity to share some of that with some, some pastors and uh, began to um, just talk a little more publicly about what that is, encourage people. I've seen that, you know, we talk about angels and your powers are not against flesh and blood, but against blah, blah, blah. You know what? And that was like a little bit of a moment where he said, this is legit, man. This is real. This is real. You know, I shook his hand, you know, and I know that I will not see him again. You know, so to be able to encourage people in that, too. And, and I don't know, you know, the Job stuff scares the daylights out of me. But um, maybe it was preparation. Our family's on a journey right now for, with some challenges. You know, we have four kids, so... There's challenges, you know, um, and so we're, we're, we're trusting in the work God did in those three days in the grave to get us through right now, <laughs> you know. Um, so, yeah, so it's just unfolding, and, and I, I don't know, it's taking shape, and maybe different things will begin to raise to the surface at different times, but yeah, yeah. And that doesn't happen, by the way, that's like, you know, it doesn't happen to me. It's not like I could say, oh, here's one of a thousand angel stories I have. You know, that, that was a unique experience for me. Do you remember what section of the book of Job you put the $60 in? Oh, good question. I don't. I, I don't remember where it was. I, I would have I shot for the back of Job, you know, for the, yeah. you know, you know, if I'd have thought quick enough. I, I could have gone straight for the restoration part, you know, bam. Right there, and he had more than he had the first time around. But I didn't think that quick, you know. I just, I just shot it in there and, uh, and was off and running, you know. But uh, tell us a little bit more about that story. Like, when the revelation come to you? Was it during the encounter? Was it after? Like, what were you thinking yeah. in? The moment. The survival in the moment, okay. you know, just trying to stay at pace with him because things were so hot to trot in that moment. I meet with a lot of folks, and so uh, that, why did that, that just stuck with me heavy. And it wasn't until a few days later, quite honestly, and it's interesting, I, one part I didn't share. When I was driving over to the mall to meet him, I called my wife, and I said, honey, I'm going to meet with a guy. Just pray for me right now. I don't do that every time I meet with somebody. I said, would you just pray for me right now? I'm just going over. I took a call. And, and uh, so it just felt unique. It felt like a unique experience in my life. And, and a couple of days later in the shower, I think, uh, where I was thinking through some of that. And that's where some of these things started to just come in line and go, wow. Okay, okay. So it just kind of unfolded. And then um, praying through when to share it and when to encourage people and some stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I was really touched by the story about the man in the restaurant mm. and that message because I yeah. feel like I have a business that that is keeping me from my ministry. So mm. that was really nice to hear that message yeah. from God that maybe I need to let that business go. Mm. Okay, okay. Yeah. May God give you the 
courage, huh? To act upon whatever he's calling you to. Whether it is your business is your ministry, or I got something else for you. I got something else for you. If it's keeping you from that, you know? And so to know in your soul what God is. I'm an artist and a writer, and I was yeah. able to do more of that last week. Yeah. And my heart wants to be there, and God wants to work through me there. Yeah. And 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 I, I don't even want to go to my other job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is your name? My name's Helen. Hel Helen, I believe that um, God will be with you and be all of those things for you wherever you are. But He's made you a certain way, and there will be avenues and things that you can be involved in that will just feel like this is what God has created me for and to lean into those things. I mean, come on, we've all had seasons of life where we've been places where we've said, Lord, just get me out of here. This doesn't, you know, but God says, I got something for you there too. But boy, when you get aligned with your gifts and your passions, like that's your sweet spot. And when you get in your sweet spot, when you have those moments where you say, Lord, I was made for this. There's nothing better. There's no drug. There's no experience, sexual or otherwise, that can match that. You know what? Yeah. Did I just say sexual? I did, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. You said otherwise. Otherwise. That's what I said. Yeah. So, God bless you. Hey, I got a couple of thoughts for you, Todd. Uh, we've been blessed to have you up at the Santa Fe Spring Store, and, and I got a a text message from Elizabeth just saying what an amazing message and they just wanted to give you a big hug oh and and a thank you uh, for me personally Love Liz. Uh, as I remember some of the other messages that you gave and and maybe this is a little bit off the track but I don't know I don't know how to ask this except you got a couple of redneck jokes for us? <laughs> oh, no. oh, gosh. Yeah, you Roger warned me. I, I don't remember any of those uh, you know, redneck jokes, you sucker, you know? Yeah, yeah. When you mow your lawn and find a car, you might be a redneck, you know? Um, when you go to family gatherings looking for a date, you might be a redneck. Uh, no, anyway. I, I don't know. I might have a few, what, Paul. What's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> no judgment, Roger. You know, hey. Do you think you might have met with an angel? Absolutely. I absolutely do. Without a shadow of a doubt or Jesus himself in that form. But I, I, there's, no, I, I don't, I, there's no doubt in my mind. Maybe that's foolish, but then, you know... Uh, I'll be more undignified than that if I have to be. But yeah, I do. I really do. I really do. Yeah. Uh, don't say that flippantly either, you know. But I know if we had our eyes open, how do the room, like what's going on in the room right now, in the battle for your soul and mine, you know, as to what you're going to do with what God has just said to you as you walk out the door? Are you kidding me? You have a choice. You walk out that door and life hits you in there, or you walk into that cubby or whatever, and life hits you in the face, and you have a choice. God loves you that much. He loves me that much that he's given us a choice in this. Are you kidding me? You know, that's love. That's love. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. There's a little twist on that, too. Go uh, for it. Right. I'll take your car, I'll take your house, but I'll let you use it for a while. But if somebody needs a ride, I want you to take my car and mm -hmm. use it for my purposes. Yeah. Or if there's a missionary that needs a place to stay, right. I want you to let them stay in my house. Right. Fantastic. So everything we own belongs yeah. to him. That's right. Absolutely. You know, and sometimes we need that tangible reminder of that, huh? Yeah. I liked your, the concept of them yeah. And us. Yeah. You know, I think we, as Christians, we think that way. And then that, you know, makes, in our mind, elevates us when that's not the case. We're right. still, you know, we're, it isn't them and us. It's all no. us. And we have to remember that because I think Christians can get kind of uppity, you know, sure. and I think that's where a lot of non-Christians, they, oh, you know, there's, they see that. Yeah. You know, and we have to remember it is all us. Yeah. That's, that was really uh, yeah. that was great. That's been something God's been impressing on me just this week. 
Henry Nouwen, one of the spiritual kind of like mentors in my life through his writings and stuff, he said that true humility, which is what we need, true humility is when we elevate the status of those around us. Not that we beat, sometimes I think it's like true humility is I'm going to beat myself into submission. I'm going to beat myself down. Well, does God want you as a child, as a son, as a daughter of the Most High God to beat yourself down? No. But when we raise the status of those around us, you know, that is a beautiful picture of humility. So the them, okay, fine. Raise them in your consciousness, whoever they are. And then lose that whole way of talking. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to actually have uh, Keith Potter pray for you. Oh, great. In closing, can I just tell you, I either met your friend Chris or one of his friends, and I'll say this in two seconds. Yeah. I was leaving a comfortable pastorate to launch into the mission field. It was okay. the hardest decision I ever had to make. Yeah. was taking my family to Santa Cruz up in the Bay Area for the last time. We love Santa Cruz. Yeah. We always went there just to get away. And I was just stressing and straining over this decision. I'm walking down the street, and there's a man leaning against a wall with his knees hugged up to his chest. And as I walked by, he said, excuse me. And I said, yes. He said, uh, the decision you're about to make, the change God is asking you to make, he will give you the courage to do it. Wow. Yeah. And someone yeah. asked, did you know it was an angel at the time? No, I walked another block before I went, you idiot. Yeah, right. <laughs> and right. I ran back to look for him, and he's gone. Right, right. And all I can say is, I know yeah. God wants to do these things right. for us. Right. And sometimes our eyes aren't open to it. So I just want to say, my no. friend. Yeah, or good. one of his friends. Oh, yeah, good. Or the other. Did he have a shirt with a crease? No, uh, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> Lord, you know Todd and um, what he has to offer. Uh, what he's given to us, he gives to others. We pray for all the energy and all the passion, all the health and all the brokenness, all the, the good, all the bad, all the pieces and parts of Todd to somehow just get, get rallied together so that he can just be this agent that you want him to be. He has been for us this morning, and I'm grateful. And I pray that he can do it for others. I pray for his family. Whatever this unspoken matter is, you know it well. Mm. And we just ask you to give him the courage and the resources to get through it. And, and even to see you in it somehow. Mm. And just pray, oh great Redeemer, that it could only be good somehow in your hands. Mm. And that's what we're praying for. And then I pray uh, for this place. Yeah. Uh, what a privilege yeah. to be at Trinity Worldwide Repro Graphics. Mm. A place where we can hear the gospel. And I might even add, get really cool signs and banners and yeah, other man. things done. That's right. I just think this place rocks. Mm. And I pray you'll even give us reasons to have to come and make mm. printed copies of mm. all kinds of things. I pray, dear God, for a blessing on Great this blessing. work and ministry. Great blessing. And then, um, and then for each person in this room, I pray that you will somehow work these divine encounters so that we can believe more tomorrow than today and more the next day than tomorrow, that you're alive, that you're active, and that you really are Lord mm. of the circumstances of our lives. So we submit ourselves to you again. Yes, it scares us to say that because mm. sometimes you disrupt our plans. But with as much heart as we can muster, we say, Lord, have your way with us. Mm. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. 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 Yeah. Thanks.